On the 19th of December, 1997, Silk Air Flight 185, a Boeing 737-300, pushed back from Jakarta International Airport for its departure to Singapore Shangji Airport. After completing a normal turnaround in Jakarta, at 0837 UTC, the aircraft got airborne from runway 25 right, bound for Shangji, with a total of 97 passengers, 5 cabin crew, and 2 flight crew on board. At the controls were the captain, a 41-year-old with over 7,000 flying hours and over 3,000 flying hours on the 737-300. And the first officer, a 23-year-old with 2,500 hours flying experience and over 2,300 hours on the 737-300. The captain was in control of the aircraft on departure and after takeoff, the aircraft was cleared direct to Palembang, which was northwest of Jakarta by 330 nautical miles. They were also further cleared to climb to flight level 350, which is approximately 35,000 feet. The crew reported reaching flight level 350 and air traffic control cleared the aircraft to route direct to Pardi, much further to the north, and report a beam Palembang. Not long after, the air traffic controller informed Silk Air Flight 185 that based on the radar feed, they could see that the flight was a beam Palembang and that the crew were to contact Singapore Control at Pardi. This was acknowledged by the crew, but this would also be the last transmission that the crew made. Up until this point, the flight was playing out in a totally normal way. The aircraft was approximately 30 minutes into a 1 hour and 50 minute flight, and the crew and passengers were climbing and routing as instructed. Yet only 8 minutes later, the aircraft was in a rapid descent and breaking up in the air as it headed for its ultimate crash site on the Muzi River Delta, 50 kilometers northeast of Palembang. In this video, we're going to look at the evidence uncovered by air crash investigators to see what conclusion, if any, was brought forward. In order to do this, we need to step into the minds of the investigators who are examining every possible piece of evidence surrounding the circumstances of the crash. It was reported that the meteorological conditions of the day of the crash were generally favourable at Jakarta, Singapore and en route in between. An aircraft flying at flight level 310, two minutes ahead of Silk Air Flight 185, had requested to route via Pardi for weather avoidance, although the nature of which was not specified. A subsequent aircraft flying at flight level 410, approximately eight minutes behind Silk Air Flight 185, reported good conditions, with the exception of two or three isolated thunderstorms around 10 miles east of the track to Palembang. It was stated that there was no turbulence associated with the thunderstorms reported by the second aircraft. It is also worth noting that the time of the incident occurred during the hours of daylight. Looking deeper into possible causes for the crash, the report stated that all the navigational aids for en route, approach and landing were fully operational with no reported faults. The runways in use at Jakarta International were routinely inspected on the day in question with normal service conditions reported and no foreign object debris. So initially we can see from this information that there was nothing of note that could be the potential cause for this catastrophic crash. The investigators then delved deeper to see what they could uncover. A recording of the Jakarta Air Traffic Control radar feed was impounded following the accident as per standard procedure, and it showed the aircraft at flight level 350 at 0912 UTC, and then on the next radar sweep 8 seconds later, the aircraft was showing at flight level 195. This was the last recorded radar data for the flight and no distress messages or signals were sent from the aircraft. This was an alarmingly high rate of descent, but while this was solid evidence of the aircraft's rapid descent, it unfortunately didn't hold any clues as to why this happened. When the aircraft crash site was located, it was discovered that the aircraft was completely destroyed by the impact and had penetrated deep into the riverbed. This was consistent with a high-speed rapid descent and also a loss of control of the aircraft in the final seconds before impact. Parts of the tail assembly of the aircraft, including the tail, vertical stabilizer and elevators, 
were located on land approximately 4 kilometers from the main crash site. Based on the distance between this wreckage and the main crash site, it could therefore be determined by the investigators that the tail part of the aircraft had broken up in flight and ultimately detached from the main fuselage of the aircraft before impact. The river delta where the impact occurred is approximately 8 meters deep and had a strong tidal flow. So when the investigators pieced together the remnants of the wreckage, it was extremely fragmented and only 73% of the aircraft structure could be recovered. When the remains of the aircraft structure were analysed, the investigators could establish that there was no onboard fire either before or at the time of the crash. There was no apparent mechanical failures and that the damage sustained was consistent with the breakup of the aircraft in the air and the impact on the river delta. Around 85% of the engines were recovered and these showed no evidence of pre or post impact fire. There was no evidence to suggest any kind of in-flight engine failure and that the engines were operating at high cruise speed on impact. The engine speed on impact is especially important as it shows that there was no input from the cockpit in attempting to reduce the power of the engines before the aircraft hit the ground. Flutter studies were also performed on the wreckage to see if this could be a factor in what transpired, but this was also ruled out. So flutter is a vibration that's caused by the aircraft surfaces interacting with the flow of air in flight. If unresolved, this can cause fatigue damage of the aircraft and its control surfaces, and in extreme cases can cause structural failure of the airframe, making it an important factor in aircraft design. The investigators went over every component they could find with a fine tooth comb, but nothing was uncovered to show any kind of obvious mechanical failure. They then turned to the onboard recording equipment to see if they could shed any light on the tragedy that unfolded. Two of the most important pieces of equipment that air crash investigators can rely on when trying to piece together the sequence of events leading up to an incident are the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder. The cockpit voice recorder is used to record the ambient audio environment of the cockpit. This includes all audible warnings, equipment sounds, and the voices of the crew or anyone in the cockpit, including communications with air traffic control, operational discussions, and just general chit chat. The flight data recorder forms part of what most people will know as the black box recorder. The job of the flight data recorder is to collect and record data from a variety of aircraft sensors in a way that is designed to survive an accident. Luckily, both of these pieces of equipment were recovered from the crash site, and what the investigators found would throw even more mystery on the whole investigation. If you cast your mind back, you will recall that Silk Air Flight 185 departed Jakarta at 0837 UTC and was given clearance to climb to flight level 350. At 0847 UTC, the aircraft reported passing flight level 245, and at 0853 UTC, the crew reported reaching flight level 350 and were cleared to route via Pardee and report a beam Palembang. At 0905 UTC, the cockpit voice recorder ceased recording. Following this, on passing a beam Palembang at 0910 UTC, air traffic control instructed the crew to maintain flight level 350 and contact Singapore Control on reaching party, and this call was acknowledged by the crew. This was documented by the air traffic control recordings, but not by the cockpit voice recorder. In addition, it would also appear that the flight data recorder ceased recording as the last readable data was at 0911 UTC. Again, this is totally unprecedented and defies a long list of laws and procedures. Based on the cockpit voice recorder data, it would appear, but could not be verified, that the captain was alone in the cockpit at the time when both of these devices ceased recording. It would also appear the captain encouraged the first officer to quote, finish his plate outside the cockpit. The transcript then shows the sound of several metallic snaps, which could be switches being moved, followed six minutes later by the sound of a snap, mere seconds before the cockpit voice recorder stopped. Both of these stoppages were completely unexplained, 
especially so when both units were found to be functioning fully and normally up until this point of the stoppage. From the available data, the reason for both the stoppages could not be determined. Neither could the interval between the stoppage of the cockpit voice recorder and then the stoppage of the flight data recorder. Following this discovery, the investigators changed course and looked further into the professional and personal backgrounds and histories of both the captain and the first officer. Based on evidence from colleagues, there were no reports of any conflicts or difficulties between the two crew members on or before the day of the crash. Based on the cockpit voice recorder, there was no conflicts in flight leading up to the incident, and all non-operational conversations seemed to be cordial. It was concluded that there was no evidence of difficulties in the working relationship between the two men. The crew's medical background was also looked into, and the investigators found that the files for each of the individuals showed no significant medical history, and they were both in good health at the time of the incident. From what had been captured on the cockpit voice recorder, it was agreed that neither crew member experienced any medical difficulties during the flight, and that neither were incapacitated or impaired in any way. It was concluded that neither pilot was adversely affected by any medical, psychological, or physiological condition for the duration of the flight. The professional history of the first officer revealed no unusual issues, and his financial records showed no evidence of financial problems. Family and colleagues stated that his behavior and demeanor leading up to and on the day of the incident were normal. The professional history of the captain showed that he was very well accepted by his peers, and had previously made a smooth transition from a military pilot to a civilian one. There were a few instances of minor operational incidents, but none of these seemed to be out of the ordinary based on a captain with that number of flying hours. However, there was one recorded incident where he infringed a Silk Air standard operating procedure. Standard operating procedures are basic company rules that all pilots abide by when flying with the airline, and they are all well versed in what they entail and are routinely checked to make sure their knowledge is current and correct. In this instance, the pilot in question reset a circuit breaker in its original position before flight, which was considered a serious incident by Silk Air as it was against their standard operating procedures. An appeal on the outcome of the investigation of this incident was unsuccessful, and while there were some indications of this individual being upset by the outcome, the full psychological impact of this event could not be determined. On the examination of the captain's financial history, it transpired that he had experienced net losses through share trading between 1990 and 1997. While there was no period of negative net worth, his trading activity had been stopped on two occasions due to non-payment of his share trade and debt. It was also determined that he held a number of life insurance policies in his name. The application of the most recent of these policies had been submitted on the 27th of November 1997 with the commencement date of the 19th of December 1997, which was the day of the incident. The investigation was in depth and no possible evidence was overlooked, yet the investigators could not find a definitive cause of what happened. So what was concluded as a result of the findings? The Indonesian National Transport Safety Committee, or NTSC, their investigation into the crash of Silk Air Flight 185 was extensive, exhaustive, and incredibly complex. The data and information available from the incomplete wreckage and the absence of complete flight data recordings were very limited, and the information about the captain's financial status and state of mind was purely circumstantial. Based on all the evidence brought forward, the NTSC investigation was ultimately unable to find the reason for the departure of the aircraft from its cruising level of flight level 350 or the reason for the stoppage of the flight recorders. A total of 97 passengers and 7 crew lost their lives in this incident, and sadly for the families of the people involved, no conclusive cause of the crash will ever be determined. But the story doesn't end there. This incident takes a slight twist as the US National Transport Safety Board responded to the Indonesian investigation report in a letter dated the 11th of December 2000. 
The NTSB states that when all of the investigative evidence is considered, it leads to the conclusions that no airplane related mechanical malfunctions or failures caused or contributed to the accident. And the accident can be explained by intentional pilot action. Specifically, the accident airplane's flight profile is consistent with sustained manual nose down flight control inputs. The evidence suggests that the cockpit voice recorder was intentionally disconnected, and it is more likely that the nose down flight control inputs were made by the captain than by the first officer. Further to this, at the time of the incident, there were also several accidents and incidents involving the Boeing 737 that were a result of uncommanded movement of their rudders. Hydraulic power control unit malfunction was suspected. The Seattle Times devoted a series of 37 articles to Boeing 737 loss of control malfunctions. And the crash of Silk Air Flight 185 occurred in the middle of a controversy over the NTSB's role in accidents caused by the rudder control unit. During the investigation of another affected flight, the NTSB discovered that the power control unit's dual servo valve could jam and deflect the rudder in the opposite direction of the pilot's input due to thermal shock caused when cold power control units were injected with hot hydraulic fluid. This was later ruled out as a cause of the crash of Flight 185 as the rudder issue had been corrected before construction started on the accident aircraft. One final point of information that I found extremely interesting but I could not corroborate with any further evidence was that the captain of Flight 185 in his previous career in the Indonesian Air Force was scheduled for a mission on the exact same date as the crash of Flight 185 in 1979. However, he had to withdraw from the mission because his Skyhawk jet had mechanical problems, but the rest of the other three aircraft continued on that training mission. During the training mission, those three aircraft collided with terrain after encountering bad weather in a mountainous area, and all of the pilots on board were killed. The only reason the captain wasn't on that mission was because his aircraft had a malfunction. So even with this further information, it is still speculation on the actual cause of the crash of Silk Air Flight 185. It'd be really interesting to see your thoughts on this incident in the comments below. I hope you found this video interesting, and if you haven't seen them, there's plenty of videos on my channel to check out on further incidents and investigations. I hope you're all having a good day, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.